Springfield, Massachusetts, the 18th day of April, 1958. This is a field recording of the poems of Sylvia Plath. A copy of this recording has been deposited with the Poetry Archive of the Library of Congress. This is Lee Anderson speaking. Sylvia Plath. Black rook in rainy weather. On the stiff twig up there hunches a wet black rook, arranging and rearranging its feathers in the rain. I do not expect a miracle or an accident to set the sight on fire in my eye. I seek no more in the desultory weather some design, but let spotted leaves fall as they fall without ceremony or portent. Although I admit I desire occasionally some back talk from the mute sky, I can't honestly complain. A certain minor light may still leap incandescent out of kitchen table or chair, as if a celestial burning took possession of the most obtuse objects now and then, thus hallowing an interval otherwise inconsequent by bestowing largesse, honor, one might say love, at any rate, I now walk wary, for it could happen even in this dull, ruinous landscape, skeptical yet politic, ignorant of whatever angel may choose to flare suddenly at my elbow. I only know that a rook, ordering its black feathers, can so shine as to seize my senses, haul my eyelids up, and grant a brief respite from fear of total neutrality. With luck trekking stubborn through this season of fatigue, I shall patch together a content of sorts. Miracles occur if you care to call those spasmodic tricks of radiance miracles. The wait's begun again, the long wait for the angel, for that rare random descent. The earthenware head. Fired in sanguine clay, the model head fit nowhere. Brick dust complected, eye under a dense lid. On the long bookshelf it stood, stolidly propping thick volumes of prose. Spite set, ape of her look. Best rid half stone at once of the outrageous head. Still, she would not junk it. No place it seemed for the effigy to sit on its pillared neck in peace. Rough boys spying an extra pate, glowering sullen and pompous from an ash heap, might well seize this prize, maltreat the hostage head in shocking ways, and rouse the sly nerve up that knits to each original its coarse copy. A dark tarn she thought of then, thick silted with weeds obscured, to serve her exacting turn. But out of the watery aspic, laurelled by fins, the simulacrum leered, lewdly beckoning, and her courage wavered. She blenched as one who drowns, and resolved more ceremoniously to lodge the mimic head in a crotched willow, green vaulted by foliage. Let bell-tongued birds descant in blackest feather on the rendering, grain by grain, of that uncouth shape to simple sod again, through drear and dulcet weather. Yet, shrined on her shelf, the grisly visage endured, despite her wrung hands, her tears, her praying, vanish. Steadfast and evil-starred, it ogled through rock fault, wind flaw and fisted wave, an antique haghead too tough for knife to finish, refusing to diminish by one jot its basilisk look of love. It goes with it, your vocabulary, you know, and your imagination. Did I like Good, good. I'm glad it comes over. Will you go on? Departure of the Ghost. 
enter the chilly no man's land of precisely five o'clock in the morning. The no-color void with a waking head rubbishes out the draggled lot of sulfurous dreamscapes and obscure lunar conundrums which seemed when dreamed to mean so profoundly much, gets ready to face the ready-made creation of chairs and bureaus and sleep-twisted sheets. This is the kingdom of the fading apparition, the oracular ghost who dwindles on pin legs to a knot of laundry, with a classic bunch of sheets upraised as a hand emblematic of farewell. At this joint between two worlds, and two entirely incompatible modes of time, the raw material of our meat and potato thoughts assumes the nimbus of ambrosial revelation, and so departs. But as chair and bureau are the hieroglyphs of some godly utterance wakened heads ignore, so these posed sheets, before they thin to nothing, speak in sign language of a lost other world a world we lose by merely waking up into sanity. The common ghosts crowed out, worms riddling its tongue, or walks for Hamlet all day on the printed page, or bodies itself for dowagers in drafty castles at twelve, or inhabits the crystal of the sick man's eye, trailing its tell-tale tatters only at the outermost fringe of mundane vision. But this ghost, goes hand aloft, goodbye, goodbye, not down into the rocky gizzard of the earth, but toward the region where our thick atmosphere diminishes, and God knows what is there. A point of exclamation marks that sky in ringing orange like a stellar carrot, its round period, displaced and green, suspends beside it the first point, the starting point of Eden, next the new moon's curve. Go, ghost of our mother and father, ghost of us, and ghost of our dreams, children, in those sheets which signify our origin and end, to the cloud cuckoo land of color wheels and pristine alphabets and cows that moo and moo as they jump over moons as new as that crisp cusp toward which you voyage now. Hail and farewell, hello, goodbye, O keeper of the profane grail, the dreaming skull. When did you write that? Oh, <laughs> spring vacation. <laughs> Why? It's very recent, I really. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your working habits? Do you concentrate for three or four days on poem, or two or three months? No, I do it, it very quickly somehow. I mean, I, I don't eat or bother with anything while I'm working on it, and I generally have somehow thought about it before. It's not as if I... I mean, I've had a subject, like I had the subject of the idea for this one for a, while, a long time without writing on it at all. And when I wrote it, I wrote it pretty much all in, in a very short space, a day or two days, I mean, all the time. Well, that's half a man quarters. With uh, nothing else, doing nothing mm -hmm. else, morning, noon, mm -hmm. and night, he was howling for supper, <laughs> and I wouldn't make him any. The Disquieting Muses Mother, mother, what ill-bred aunt, or what disfigured and unsightly cousin did you so unwisely keep unasked to my christening, that she sent these ladies in her stead with heads like darning eggs to nod, and nod and nod at foot and head and at the left side of my crib. Mother who made such lovely stories of Mixy Blackshort the hero bear, mother whose witches always, always got baked into gingerbread. I wonder whether you saw them, whether you said, words to rid me of those three ladies nodding by night around my bed, mouthless, eyeless, with stitched bald head. In the hurricane when father's twelve study windows bellied in like bubbles about to break, you fed my brother and me cookies and Ovaltine and helped us somewhat thinly choir. Thor is angry, boom, boom, boom. Thor is angry, we don't care. But those ladies broke the panes. When on tiptoe the schoolgirls danced, 
blinking flashlights like fireflies and singing the glowworm's song. I could not lift a foot in the twinkle dress, but heavy-footed stood aside in the shadow cast by my dismal-headed godmothers, and you cried and cried, and the shadow stretched, the lights went out. Mother, you sent me to piano lessons and praised my arabesques and trills, although each teacher found my touch oddly wooden in spite of scales and the hours of practicing, my ear tone-deaf and, yes, unteachable. I learned, I learned, I learned elsewhere from muses unhired by you, dear mother. I woke one day to see you, mother, floating above me in bluest air on a green balloon bright with a million flowers and bluebirds that never were, never, never found anywhere. But the little planet bobbed away like a soap bubble, as you called, come here, and I faced my traveling companions. Day now, night now, at head, side, feet, they stand their vigil in gowns of stone, faces blank as the day I was born, their shadows long in the setting sun that never brightens or goes down. And this is the kingdom you bore me to, mother, mother, but no frown of mine will betray the company I keep. When did you write that? Spring vacation. <laughs> it's actually the only time I've had to write for a very long time, and that's one of the reasons why I'm not teaching next year, because I found it really impossible to write while I was working and teaching. And also, the kind of uh, analysis I do with my classes is somehow inimical to the sort of work I do by myself. So I feel that um, actually I do want to spend a year just writing and uh, eating and sleeping when it happens, but writing most of the time, yeah. <laughs> That's important. Yeah. What poet do you read before you do? Well, um, Yeats, <laughs> Ted Hughes continually, and Yeats, um, Yeats, Eliot, John Crow Ransom especially. I have um, started reading Robert Lowell. I like a, a good deal in Robert Lowell. And uh, then, let's see, Shakespeare, Chaucer, who else? Uh, Thomas Wyatt, um, who else, Ted, you know? Hopkins, yes, Gerard Manley Hopkins. And let's see, what others? I think Yeats is, I, I like very, very much. In particular, one of my favorites. Uh, do you feel that your work has been influenced by anyone in particular? I find that hard to say. Really it's so really queer. Um, does it remind you of, of no, something? No, 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 but I wonder if you felt that there was any particular... Well, the strange thing, I think of anything, for instance, I mean, I'd never th say that this last poem was influenced by Yeats, but for instance, I learned uh, my first changing in sound, assonance and consonance from Yeats, which, I mean, actually is technical. I was very excited when I discovered this. I also read uh, Dylan Thomas a good deal for the subtleties of sound. I'd never worked with anything except rhyme before, and very rigid rhyme, and so I began uh, developing schemes and patterns of sound that were somehow less obvious, but you get, you get them through your ear, if not through your eye. And I think that uh, I just happened to learn this from Yeats, and Thomas, too, in a way. Well, are you ready to read another poem? Sure. Go ahead. Battle scene from the comic operatic fantasy, The Seafarer. It beguiles this little odyssey in pink and lavender over a surface of gently graded turquoise tiles that represent a sea with checkered waves and gaily bear up the seafarer, gaily, gaily, and his pink plume and armor. A fairy tale gondola of paper ferries the fish pond Sinbad, who poises his pastel spear toward three pinky purple monsters which uprear off the ocean floor with fanged and dreadful head. Beware, beware, the whale, the shark, the squid. But fins and scales of each scrolled sea beast troll no slime, no weed, they are polished for the joust, they gleam like Easter eggshells, rose and amethyst. Ahab, fulfill your boast, bring home each storied head, one thrust, one thrust, one thrust, and they are dead. 
so fables go, and so all children sing, their bathtub battles deep, hazardous and long. But oh, sage grown-up snow, sea dragon for sofa, fang for pasteboard, and siren song for fever in a sleep, laughing, laughing of grey beards wakes us up. On the decline of oracles. My father kept a speckled conch by two bronze bookends of ships in sail, and as I listened its cold teeth seethed with voices of that ambiguous sea, old Birkeland mist, who held a shell to hear the sea he could not hear. What the seashell spoke to his inner ear he knew, but no peasants know. My father died, and when he died, he willed his books and shell away. The books burned up, sea took the shell, but I, I keep the voices he set in my ear, and in my eye the sight of those blue unseen waves for which the ghost of Birklin grieves. The peasants feast and multiply, and never need see what I see. In the temple of broken stones, above a worn curtain, rears the white head of a god or madman. Nobody knows which or dares ask. From him I have tomorrow's gossip and doldrums. So much is vision good for. Like a persistent stitch in the side, it nags, is tedious. Straddling a stool in the third floor window booth of the Alexandra house of a petty curé, I regard with some fatigue the smoky rooms of the restaurant opposite. See impose itself on the cook at the steaming stove, a picture of what's going to happen. I've to wait it out. It will come. It comes. Three barely known men are coming up a stair. This veils both stove and cook. One is pale with orange hair. Behind glasses, the second's eyes are blurred. The third walks, leaning on a stick and smiling. These trivial images invade the cloistral eye like pages from a gross comic strip. And toward the happening of this happening, the earth turns now. In half an hour, I shall go down the shabby stair and meet coming up those three. Worth less than present, past, this future. Worthless such vision to eyes gone dull that once described Troy's towers fall, saw evil break out of the north. Poem for Paul Clay's Perseus, The Triumph of Wit Over Suffering. Head alone shows you in the prodigious act of digesting what centuries alone digest, the mammoth lumbering statuary of sorrow, indissoluble enough to riddle the guts of a whale with holes and holes and bleed him white into salt seas. Hercules had a simple time rinsing those stables. A baby's tears would do it. But who'd volunteer to gulp the Laocoon, the dying Gaul, and those innumerable pietas festering on the dim walls of Europe's chapels, museums, and sepulchres? You, you who borrowed feathers for your feet, not lead, not nails, and a mirror to keep the snaky head in safe perspective, could outface the gorgon grimace of human agony. A look to numb limbs, not a basilisk blink, nor a double whammy, but all the accumulated last grunts, groans, cries, and heroic couplets, concluding the million enacted tragedies on these blood-soaked boards, and every private twinge a hissing asp to petrify your eyes, and every village catastrophe a writhing length of cobra, and the decline of empires, the thick coil of a vast anaconda. Imagine the world fisted to a fetus head, ravined, seamed with suffering from conception upwards, and there you have it in hand. Grit in the eye or a sore thumb can make anyone wince, but the whole globe expressive of grief
turns gods like kings to rocks, those rocks cleft and worn themselves then grow ponderous and extend despair on earth's dark face. So might rigor mortis come to stiffen all creation were it not for a bigger belly still than swallows joy. You enter now, armed with feathers to tickle as well as fly, and a funhouse mirror that turns the tragic muse to the beheaded head of a sullen doll, one braid a bedraggled snake hanging limp as the absurd mouth hangs in its lugubrious pout. Where are the classic limbs of stubborn Antigone, the red royal robes of Phaedra, the tear-dazzled sorrows of Malthy's gentle duchess, Gone in the deep convulsion gripping your face, muscles and sinews bunched victorious as the cosmic laugh does away with the unstitching, plaguy wounds of an eternal sufferer. To you, Perseus, the palm, and may you poise and repoise until time stop the celestial balance which weighs our madness with our sanity. You seem to be an extremely scrupulous prophetess. Do you take a great interest in... Well, how do you mean? How do you mean? <laughs> well, from the standpoint of watching your uh, syllables repeat and your uh, beat as you go along. I suppose, <laughs> well, I suppose, you know. Does she read? Does she do? Does she read? Does it? Because I don't want to stop, and yet somehow I want it to be there, you know, because the lines don't end, they go on, and yet they do end in a way. You can always tell when she's composing, she's going like this. <laughs> 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 uh, on the difficulty of conjuring up a dryad. Ravening through the persistent bric-a-brac of blunt pencils, rose-sprigged coffee cup, postage stamps, stacked books, clamor and yop, neighborhood cock-crow, all nature's prodigal back-talk, the vaunting mind snubs impromptu spiels of wind and wrestles to impose its own order on what is. With my fantasy alone, brags the importunate head, arrogant among rook-tongued spaces, sheep greens, finned falls. I shall compose a crisis to stun sky blackout, drive gibbering mad trout cock ram that bulk so calm on my jealous stare, self-sufficient as they are. But no hocus-pocus of green angels damasks with dazzle the threadbare eye. My trouble doctor is I see a tree, and that damn scrupulous tree won't practice wiles to beguile sight, e.g. by a cant of light concoct a Daphne. My tree stays tree. However I wrench obstinate bark and trunk to my sweet will, no luminous shape steps out radiant in limb, eye, lip, to hoodwink the honest earth, which point-blank spurns such fiction as nymphs. Cold vision will have no counterfeit palmed off on it. No doubt now in dream propertied fall, some moon-eyed star-lucky sleight of handman watches my jilting lady squander coin, gold leaf stock ditches, and the opulent air goes studded with seed, while this beggared brain hatches no fortune, but from leaf, from grass, thieves what it has. Do you hear the music, or do you get the image of starting a poem? Is there some kind of a rhythm that goes... It's very funny, because I haven't an ear for music, but I hear the music and the rhythm, which somehow um, I don't think about, you know? It's funny. Uh, I, s I, I have a visual imagination. For instance, my inspiration is paintings and not music when I go to, to some other art form. What do you think, Ted? I mean, I see these things very clearly, and I have visual images, and yet the sound itself is terrifically strong. Yes, it is. Do you know what I mean? Oh, um, yes, that's eloquent. That's, that's a great pleasing quality. 
I mean, I feel ideally I'd like to be musical without being artificial, which I think is sometimes difficult, and to be able to speak out, you know, straight out the way you talk, which, which is, again, is ter terrifically hard, while getting all the illusions and, and richness in that you get in rhetoric, which, you know, I mean, <laughs> it's like eating cake and wanting to have it, I guess. November Graveyard The scene stands stubborn. Skinflint trees hoard last leaves, won't mourn, wear sackcloth, or turn to elegiac dryads, and dour grass guards the hard-hearted emerald of its grassiness, however the grandiloquent mind may scorn such poverty. So no dead men's cries, flower forget-me-nots, between the stone paving this grave ground. Here's honest rot to unpick the elaborate heart, pare bone free of the fictive vein. When one stark skeleton bulks real, all saints' tongues fall quiet. Flyers watch no resurrections in the sun. At the essential landscape, stare, stare till your eyes foist a vision dazzling on the wind. Whatever lost ghosts flare, damned, howling in their shrouds across the moor, rave on the leash of the starving mind which peoples the bare room, the blank, untenanted air. Sow. God knows how our neighbor managed to breed his great sow. Whatever his shrewd secret, he kept it hid in the same way he kept the sow, impounded from public stare, prize ribbon, and pig show. But one dusk our questions commended us to a tour through his lantern-lit maze of barns to the lintel of the sunk sty door to gape at it. Behold, no rose and larkspurred china suckling with a penny slot for thrifty children, nor dolt pig, ripe for heckling, about to be glorified for prime flesh and golden crackling in a parsley halo, nor even one of the common barnyard sows, Maya smirched, blousy, munching thistle and knotweed on her snout cruise, bloat ton of milk on the move, hedged by a litter of feet-foot ninnies, shrilling her hulk to halt for a swig at the pink tits. No, this vast, brobdingnag bulk of a sow lounged belly-bedded on that black compost, fat rutted eyes dream-filmed. What a vision of ancient hoghood must thus wholly engross the great grandam. Our marvel blazoned a night in glittering guise, unhorsed and shredded in the grove of combat by a grisly bristled boar, fabulous enough to straddle that sow's heat. But our farmer whistled, then with a jocular fist thwacked the barrel nape, and the green copse castled pig hove, letting legend like dried mud drop, slowly grunt on grunt, up in the flickering light to shape a monument. Prodigious in gluttonies is that hog whose want made lean lent of kitchen slops, and stomaching no constraint, proceeded to swill the seven troughed seas and every earthquaking continent. Spinster. Now this particular girl, during a ceremonious April walk with her latest suitor, found herself of a sudden intolerably struck by the bird's irregular babble and the leaves litter. By this tumult afflicted, she observed her lover's gestures unbalanced the air. His gait stray uneven through a rank wilderness of fern and flower. She judged petals in disarray, the whole season sloven. How she longed for winter then, scrupulously austere in its order of white and black, ice and rock, each sentiment within border and heart's frosty discipline exact as a snowflake. But here, a burgeoning unruly enough to pitch her five queenly wits into vulgar motley, a treason not to be born, let idiots reel giddy in bedlam spring, she withdrew neatly, 
and round her house she set such a barricade of barb and check against mutinous weather as no mere insurgent man could hope to break with curse, fist, threat, or love either. I was about surprised. What's this? Didn't you get a prize for, what was the name of it? You don't mean for Poetry Chicago, do you? Um, Is that it? Well, I got one from Poetry Chicago this fall, I guess, for some poems I had in that. But actually, that's the only one I can think of recently. You mean the one I mentioned from this last couple of years? Yes. Oh, but that was, that was when I read when I was a student, Teddy, you know, a long time back. This is Sylvia Plath continuing the reading of her poems on Reel 2, on the plethora of dryads. Hearing a white saint rave about a quintessential beauty, visible only to the paragon heart, I tried my sight on an apple tree that for eccentric knob and wart had all my love. Without meat or drink, I sat, starving my fantasy down, to discover that metaphysical tree which hid from my worldling look its brilliant vein far deeper in gross wood than axe could cut. But before I might blind sense to see with the spotless soul, each particular quirk so ravished me, every pock and stain bulked more beautiful than flesh of any body flawed by love's prints. Battle however I would, to break through that patchwork of leaves bicker and whisk in babbled tongues, streak and mottle of torn bark, no visionary lightnings pierced my dense lid. Instead, a wanton fit dragged each dazzled sense apart, surfeiting eye, ear, taste, touch, smell. Now, snared by this miraculous art, I ride earth's burning carousel day in, day out, and such grit corrupts my eyes, I must watch sluttish dryads twitch their multifarious silks in the holy grove, until no chaste tree but suffers blotch under flux of those seductive reds, greens, blues. All the dead deers. Rigged poker stiff on her back with a granite grin, this antique museum cased lady lies, companioned by the gym crack relics of a mouse and a shrew that battened for a day on her ankle bone. These three, unmasked now, bear dry witness to the gross eating game we'd wink at if we didn't hear stars grinding crumb by crumb our own grist down to its bony face. How they grip us through thin and thick, these barnacle dead. This lady here's no kin of mine, yet kin she is. She'll suck blood and whistle my marrow clean to prove it. As I think now of her head from the mercury-backed glass Mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, reach hag hands to haul me in, and an image looms under the fish-pond surface where the daft father went down with orange duck feet winnowing his hair. All the long-gone darlings, they get back, though, soon, soon, be it by wakes, weddings, childbirths, or a family barbecue, any touch, taste, tangs fit for those outlaws to ride home on and to sanctuary, usurping the armchair between tick and tack of the clock until we go 
each skulled and cross-boned Gulliver, riddled with ghosts to lie, deadlocked with them, taking root as cradles rock. Uh, what is your working philosophy? <laughs> My working philosophy? As as you, uh, you mean as far as writing poetry goes? Um, your own. About what poetry should be? Yes. Well, it's hard to say. My own poetry Technically, as I've said, I'd like it to be extremely musical and lyrical with a singing sound. I don't like poetry that just uh, throws itself away in prose. In other words, I don't like poetry that you could um, that, that is bad prose, and I think a lot of poetry is bad prose. I think there should be a kind of constriction, a kind of tension, which is never artificial and yet keeps in the uh, meaning in a kind of music, too. And again, I like the idea of managing to get wit in with seriousness and contrast, ironies. And I like visual images, and I like just good mouthfuls of sound which have meaning. I think that's another thing. I don't like just ramping about in sound, but having a very strong meaning come through the first time. In other words, I'd like people to understand what I'm talking about the first time they read the poem and to understand it more and more, the more they hear it. In other words, to be able to go deeper. But I don't want to baffle anybody. And I suppose that working in my own uh, study, it may be queer to other people. It seems to me very obvious, and very ordinary. And I don't know how strange it may sound is that I'm accustomed to it. I mean, I have really no idea. I haven't read aloud enough. Very few people have read my poems anyway, so I have no idea how they affect other people. But uh, You don't consider that it's necessary to write in a strict form in order to get music? Well, at first I started in a strict form. It's the easiest way, I think, for the beginner to get music ready-made. But I think that, that now I like to work in forms that are strict, and yet um, this strictness isn't uncomfortable, sort of like a comfortable corset or something, I suppose. It isn't really noticeable and obvious, but it's there. There's some bone, some skeletal structure to the poem. And I think that, for me at least, I'm very much lyrically inclined, and I lean very strongly toward uh, forms which are, I suppose, quite rigid in comparison, certainly, to free verse. I'm much happier when I know that all my sounds are echoing in different ways throughout the poem than if I just forget about it. That's an important thing, I think. It's not necessary to confine yourself to a lyric in order to get a, a real sweep of music. You get yeah. long lines and they go along and yes. they just yeah. the wave of the music. Mm. And the longer you go on, the more the the music builds up. Yes, yes, and all the time your ear is recording this, although even your your eye mightn't see it, I mean, uh, unless you pick it out and stop to pick it out, but I'm sure poetry should be read. That's another thing. I think that a lot of, of, of poetry isn't good when you read it, because it's made for the eye, and it's very ugly to the ear. And I like ugly effects. I mean, one of my favorite uh, sounds is rock, black, and all the words that go against that very hard K sound. Um, and yet, I'm, which of, of course I, sp I suppose um, are ugly if they're all piled up, but they're not to me. But I think that poetry should be able to be read with a good effect to the ear. I suppose I am, you know, very sensuously inclined that way. I like extremely vivid pictures in poetry, not just grey poetry, and I like it very musical, you know, which I guess isn't as fashionable now as it once was. Well, let's yeah. try to make it the fashion. <laughs> You have been listening to Sylvia Plath read her poems. This has been a field recording of Sylvia Plath's poems and comments made in Springfield, Massachusetts on the 18th day of April, 1958. A copy of this recording has been deposited with the Poetry Archive of the Library of Congress. Permission for this broadcast has been obtained from the copyright owners. This is Lee Anderson speaking. This is their letter to Lee Anderson of Glen Rock, Pennsylvania, 
The intent of it is to put in a formal way the understanding made about the use of tape recordings of my poetry produced by him at his own expense. Lee Anderson has my permission to send my recordings to the poetry archive of the Library of Congress to be copied and deposited for reference and scholarly purposes. Any other use by the Library of Congress will require my permission and that of the copyright owners. Lee Anderson also has my permission to dispose of the recordings in any way he may elect, except that they may not be used for paid audiences or sold in reproductions for commercial non-educational purposes. Should Lee Anderson elect to transfer his collection of tapes to an educational institution, he may include my recordings and the college or university shall have a host's privilege of use, but specifically shall not use my recordings for commercial reproduction without my own and the copyright owner's permission. This is Sylvia Plath signing off. The date is April 18th, 1958. And there's one correction, partly at his own expense. <laughs> <laughs> Springfield, Massachusetts, the 18th day of April, 1958. This is a field recording of Poems and Commentary by Ted Hughes. A copy of this reading has been deposited with the Poetry Archive of the Library of Congress. This is Lee Anderson speaking. The man seeking experience inquires his way of a drop of water. This water droplet, charity of the air, out of the watched blue immensity, where, where are the angels? Out of the draft in the door, the Tuscarora, the cloud, the cup of tea, the sweating victor and the decaying dead bird. This droplet has traveled far and studded hard. Now clings on the cream paint of our kitchen wall. Aged eye, this without heart, head, nerve, lens, which saw the first and earth's centering jewel spark upon darkness, behemoth, bulk, and lumber out of the instant flash, and man's hand hoist him upright still hangs clear and round. Having studied a journey in the high cathedraled brain, the mole's ear, the fisher's ice, the abattoir of the tiger's artery, the slum of the dog's bowel, and there is no place his bright look has not bettered, and problem none, that he has brought it to solution. Venerable elder, let us learn of you. Read us a lesson, a plain lesson, how experience has worn or made you anew, that on this humble kitchen wall hang now. O oh, dew that condensed of the breath of the word, on the mirror of the syllable of the word. So he spoke, aloud, grandly, then stood for an answer, knowing his own nature all droplet kin, Sisters and brothers of lymph and blood listened for himself to speak for the drop self. This droplet was clear, simple water still. It no more responded than the hour old child does to finger toy or coy baby talk, but who lies long, long and frowningly, unconscious under the shock of its own quick. After that first alone in creation cry, when into the mesh of sense, out of the dark, blundered the world shouldering monstrous eye. The Horses. I climbed through woods in the hour before dawn dark. Evil air the frost-making stillness. Not a leaf, not a bird, a world cast in frost. I came out above the wood where my breath left tortuous statues in the iron light. 
but the valleys were draining the darkness to the moorline, blackening dregs of the brightening grey halved at the sky ahead, and I saw the horses, huge in the dense grey, ten together, megalith still. They breathed, making no move, with draped manes and tilted hind hooves, making no sound. I passed, not one snorted or jerked its head, grey silent fragments of a grey silent world. I listened in emptiness on the moor ridge. The curlew's tear turned its edge on the silence. Slowly detail leafed from the darkness. Then the sun, orange, red, red, erupted silently and splitting to its core, tore and flung cloud, shook the gulf open, showed blue and the big planets hanging. I turned, stumbling in the fever of a dream, down towards the dark woods from the kindling tops and came to the horses. There still they stood, but now steaming and glistening under the flow of light, the draped stone manes, their tilted hind hooves, stirring under a thaw, while all around them the frost showed its fires. But still they made no sound, not one snorted or stamped. Their hung heads patient as the horizons, high over valleys in the red leveling rays, in din of the crowded streets, going among the years, the faces, may I still meet my memory in so lonely a place between the streams and the red clouds, hearing curlews, hearing the horizons endure. Famous poet, stare at the monster. Remark how difficult it is to define just what amounts to monstrosity in that very ordinary appearance. Neither thin nor fat, hair between light and dark, and the general air of an apprentice, say, an apprentice house painter or amid an assembly of famous architects. The demeanor is of mouse, yet is he monster. First scrutinize those eyes for the spark, the effulgence, nothing. Nothing there but the haggard, stony exhaustion of a near-finished variety artist. He slumps in his chair like a badly hurt man, half life size. Is it his dreg boozed inner demon, still tankarding from tissue and follicle the vital fire, the spirit electrical that puts the gloss on a normal hearty male? Or is it women? The truth, bring it on with black drapery, drums and funeral tread, like a grit man's coffin. No, no, he is not dead, but in this truth surely half buried. Once the humiliation of youth and obscurity, the autoclave of heady ambition trapped, the fermenting of a yeasty heart stopped, burst with such pyrotechnics the dull world gaped, and repeat that, still they cry. But all his efforts to concoct the old heroic bang from their money and praise, from the parents pointing finger and the child's amaze, even from the burning of his wreathed bays, have left him wrecked, wrecked and monstrous, so as a stegosaurus, a lumbering, obsolete arsenal of gigantic horn and plate from a time when half the world still burned, set to blink behind bars at the zoo. If it weren't for the sitting at Slouch and, uh, and his chair, I think I come to torture this, but it isn't the man I think it is. Who do you think it is? Oh, I couldn't think of saying so. Oh, no, please. <laughs> oh, please. no, oh. never. The man's my dearest friend. <laughs> <One of them. laughs> no, wait. Oh, dear, no. No, well, Ted's had a bad time with that, but the people have interpreted it as absolutely everybody.
somebody in one review of his said he and he's taken Dylan Thomas and he copies Dylan Thomas, he's like Dylan Thomas, and look what sort of a poem he writes about him. And the po poem was published in an issue of a London magazine, and now that I think of it, it's pretty funny of them to put it in, you know? In that particular issue, it was an issue, issue about it's Dylan Thomas, more or less. Dylan yeah. Thomas, and Ted had absolutely, um, I mean, Dylan Thomas would be one of the last people he'd be thinking of, so now he says it's the Polish national poet, Mickey of it. Well, so it is. <laughs> Byron in his last month. <laughs> you know what he's <laughs> telling me. Okay. The Jaguar. The apes yawn and adore their fleas in the sun. The parrots shriek as if they were on fire or strut like cheap tarts to attract the stroller with a nut. Fatigued with indolence, tiger and lion lie still as the sun. The boa constrictor's coil is a fossil. Cage after cage seems empty, or stinks of sleepers from the breathing straw. It might be painted on a nursery wall. But who runs like the rest past these? Arrives at a cage where the crowd stands, stares, mesmerized as a child at a dream, at a jaguar hurrying in rage through prison darkness after the drills of his eyes on a short, fierce fuse. Not in boredom, the eye is satisfied to be blind in fire, by the bang of blood in the brain, deaf the ear, he spins from the bars. But there's no cage to him, more than to the visionary, his cell. His stride is wildernesses of freedom. The world rolls under the long thrust of his heel. Over the cage floor, the horizons come. The Dove Breeder. Love struck into his life, like a hawk into a dove coat. What a cry went up. Every gentle pedigree dove blindly clattered and beat, and the mild-mannered dove breeder shrieked at that raider. He might well wring his hands and let his tears drop. He will win no more prizes with fantails or pouters after all these years through third, up through second places, till they were all world beaters. Yet he soon dried his tears. Now he rides the morning mist with a big-eyed hawk on his fist. A modest proposal. There is no better way to know us then us two wolves come separately to a wood. Now neither is able to sleep, even at a distance distracted by the soft competing pulse of the other, nor able to hunt at every step, looking backwards and sideways, wearying to listen for the other's slavering rush. Neither can make die the painful burning of the coal in its heart till the other's body and the whole wood is its own. Then it might sob contentment toward the moon. Each in a thicket, rage horse in its laboring chest after a skirmish, licks the rents in its hide. Eyes brighter than is natural under the leaves, where a wren, peeping round a leaf, shrieks out, to see a chink so terrifyingly open onto the red smelting of hatred, as each pictures a final satisfaction. Suddenly they duck and peer, and there rides by the great lord from hunting. His embroidered cloak floats, the tail of his horse pours, and at his stirrup the two great-eyed greyhounds 
that day after day bring down the towering stag, leap like one, making delighted sounds. Meeting. He smiles in a mirror, shrinking the whole sun-swung zodiac of light to a trinket shape on the rise of his eye. It is a role in which he can fling a cape and outloom life like Faustus. But once when, on an empty mountain slope, a black goat clattered and ran towards him and set four feet firm on a rock above and looked down a square pupiled yellow-eyed look, the black devil head against the blue air, what gigantic fingers took him up and on a bare palm turned him close under an eye that was like a living hanging hemisphere and watched his blood's gleam with a ray slow and cold and ferocious as a star till the goat clattered away. When did you decide on a career as a poet? When I was about 15. Have you saved any of the heirlooms? No, I haven't. I've destroyed them all, burnt them all at one time or another. Well, I rescued some, and I'm sure it would have gone the way of fire and everything. Just left them about in little scraps of paper. The earliest one in this is this one song. The rest I've either lost or destroyed. They when wouldn't. did you write the earliest? That was our one. I was, I guess, I was eighteen. So. What year? I was about eighteen when I did. Oh, it. Yeah. Mm. The rest I've written in the last two years. Mm. It's amazing, isn't it? Wind. This house has been far out at sea all night. The woods crashing through darkness, the booming hills, wind stampeding the fields under the window, floundering black astride and blinding wet till day rose. Then, under an orange sky, the hills had new places, and wind wielded blade light, luminous black and emerald, flexing like the lens of a mad eye. At noon, I scaled along the house side as far as the co-house door, once I looked up. Through the brunt wind that dented the balls of my eyes, the tent of the hills drummed and strained its guy rope, the fields quivering, the skyline a grimace, at any second to bang and vanish with a flap. The wind flung a magpie away, and a black back gull bent like an iron bar slowly. The house rang like some fine green goblet in the note that any second would shatter it. Now deep in chairs, in front of the great fire, we grip our hearts and cannot entertain book, thought, or each other. We watch the fire blazing and feel the roots of the house move, but sit on, seeing the windows tremble to come in, hearing the stones cry out under the horizons. Roar is in a ring. Snow fell as for Wences last. The moor foamed like a white running sea. The starved fox stared at the inlight. In the red gridded glare of peat, Faces sweating like hams, farmers roared their Christmas Eve out of the low beams. Good company kept a laugh in the air, as if they tossed a ball to top the skip of a devil that struck at it with his tail, or struck at the man who held it long. They so tossed laughter up, you would have thought that if they did not laugh, they must weep. Therefore the ale went round and round. 
their mouths flung wide, the cataract of a laugh, less silence, drink blood. And their eyes were screwed so tight, while their grand bellies shook. Oh, their flesh would drop to dust at the first sober look. The air was new as a razor, the moor looked like the moon, when they all went roaring homewards an hour before dawn. Those living images of their death, better than with skill, blindly and rowdily balanced, gently took their fall, while the world under their foot soles went whirling still, gay and forever, in the bottomless black silence through which it fell. Do you find that it helps you being married to a poet? You pool resources, you know. It's funny, I thought psychically, that I'd never marry a writer because I thought it would be a bad thing, you know. Whenever I read Ted's poems, and I read his poems before I met him, I felt that they were, well, I felt that they were very fine. And it worked out. We both started writing poems to each other continually and setting each other subjects and so on. And he's my best reader, and I'm sure I'm one of his most critical readers. And the funny thing is both of us are objective in a way, and yet... You know, not not badly critical, and I'm just happy when he gets some acceptances, and uh, certainly even more so than I am for myself. And it works sort of that way, you know. It's it's, it's like an Ouija board, you know. That always yeah. there's two people are better than one, or the people that uh, <laughs> no auto automatic writers, you know. No one could understand my not getting supper and so forth when I'm writing, and he knows perfectly well <laughs> what the trouble is. <laughs>